Halloween. How are you all doing today? Hey guys, how you doing? I'm seeing people I haven't seen in a little while. Hey, we always like to start our services today, or on Sundays, to uh, welcome all of you. If you're joining us here in our sanctuary for the very first time, or if you're joining us online for the first time, we want to say welcome. We're so glad you're here to worship with us here at Hosanna. I am Pastor Nathan, and this morning we're going to be looking at the last, last gasp of the devil. Finally. Excited to get to this point. We're going to be seeing his final destiny in our study of Revelation here. You know, ever since Satan fell and then went on to cause Adam and Eve to do the same, things in creation have just gone to ruin. They have just gone to ruin. Ruin has come upon the earth as generation after generation has been born with an evil, sinful nature. And with that curse that has come down through mankind, death has come down through it all. And ever since then, all of creation, including us, we are God's creation, have been waiting for the time where Jesus Christ, the creator, would return, come back to his creation, set up his kingdom, retake full control over all of it. And as we've been studying in Revelation, we will, we're seeing that this will indeed happen during the millennial kingdom. But until then, evil is spreading, has been spreading, and for generations has been having a field day of it. And I say that because as we look around our world today, it's not hard to see that evil and wickedness and depravity is more and more rewarded and celebrated in our culture while good is being punished and slandered and called bigoted and naive and wrong. And, and the more we witness this as God's people, the more time marches forward and we see this depravity get worse, the more we find ourselves saying, yeah, Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And one day, that prayer will be answered in its fullness. But we don't see it just yet. And the fact that we don't see that yet here on earth has been one of the major reasons that skeptics have a problem with God. You see, they ask questions like, if God is real, why is there evil? If God is real, why is there suffering? If, if God exists, why doesn't he step in and stop evil and suffering? And one of the classic arguments of atheists and those who deny God is this. If God is all-powerful, he could stop evil and destroy it. If God is all good, then he would destroy evil. And since evil is not destroyed, therefore, there is no God. Well, chapter 20 of Revelation answers this erroneous line of logic. And we see in chapter 20 of Revelation, Satan, the, the perpetuator of evil, bound for a thousand years. We're going to see during this thousand years that Jesus Christ is here on earth ruling and reigning. Most importantly, what we see is at the end of the thousand-year millennial kingdom, Satan is allowed to rise up one last time, and then he is dealt with for good. See, there are two events that kind of bookend the millennial kingdom. On the front side, we have what's known as the binding of Satan. And the binding of Satan will indeed happen. He will be bound. He will be tossed into the abyss. He will be restrained from tempting mankind in any way, shape, or form during the millennial kingdom. And this serves one of the major purposes of the millennial kingdom. But then on the other side is the final judgment of Satan, which will also happen. is an absolute truth and a guaranteed circumstance, and that serves as God's final word about sin and rebellion. It's these two events, the binding and the judgment, that bookend the millennial kingdom, and it's what we're looking at today. But as we see these two events and look at what they mean, it shows us that evil and wickedness and temptation and sin and the one who perpetuates all of it will one day fully, finally, and completely be destroyed. Hallelujah. So. That's what we're looking at today in Revelation chapter 20, but first we're going to spend some time in worship. We want to praise God. We want to praise God for who he is. We want to praise God for what he's done. We want to praise God for what he's going to do, because we so look forward to the time where righteousness rules and reigns, where perfection is, is the state of existence, but even beyond that, the eternity 
that we get to spend with our Lord and our Savior, our Creator in paradise is just uh, something to look forward to. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. And God, we are so looking forward to these these times, these events that, that we've been studying, Lord. God, we know that there's a time coming of tribulation upon the earth, and oh, Lord, it's, it's, it's heavy, it's difficult, it's, it's horrific. But God, we, we, we've moved past that in our study of, of this revelation of Jesus Christ, Lord, and we're looking at this glorious time called the Millennial Kingdom. And God, as we study this, I just pray, Lord, that we would further be encouraged by what is to come, God. That we would be encouraged today to not lose heart, Lord, because your promises are true. That you are faithful and true, God, and we know these things are coming to pass, God. And so, Lord, as we labor today in this age of grace, God, while evil is still running rampant, God, we are called to be people to take the message of the gospel and the good news into this world, to share the hope of salvation with those who don't have it. And God, a part of that hope is this millennial kingdom in eternity to come after. And so God bless us today, speak to us today, encourage us today, especially, Lord, as we look towards our hope that one day Satan will be bound and one day Satan will be finally and fully judged, no longer tempting us, no longer roaming and roaring and seeking to kill and to steal and to destroy, but he will be done. Hallelujah, Lord. God, we want to worship you now for all of it. We praise your holy name, God, because you are worth it. You are almighty, you are just, you are pure, you are love, you are light, God. You are amazing. So God, be blessed as we worship you now, as we praise your name. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in Revelation chapter 20. In our last message, we kind of looked at somewhat of an overview of the millennial kingdom, really what it is scripturally, because here in Revelation chapter 20, it's kind of a brief mention of the millennial kingdom. It kind of just mentions it real quick and then moves right past it. But as we were doing this quick overview, we kind of looked real fast at verses 1 through 6, um, really as a summary statement of this entire thousand-year millennial kingdom. And today we're going to take a bit of a closer look at verses 1 through 6, and we're going to go all the way down to verses 10, which collectively is really the beginning, the middle, and the end of the millennial kingdom. And the items that we're going to see of major focus here in Revelation 20 um, in this brief look at the millennial kingdom are the removal of Satan that happens right before the millennium is ushered in, the reign of the saints, which takes place during the millennial kingdom, and then the release of Satan, which involves a revolt of a certain segment of society, and then ultimately the recapture and the final judgment of Satan himself, which all takes place at the very end of the millennial kingdom. And then next time we get together after the holidays, because we will be spending time looking at Christmas and celebrating the birth of Jesus next week, when we do come back to look at Revelation again, we will look at the final judgment of the wicked and deal with the topic of the great white throne judgment. So, but today, verses 1 through 10, again, forms an outline overview of the millennial kingdom with a focus on three elements. And so let's look at the first one in verses 1 through 3. It's the removal of Satan. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. So the first thing I want to point out is this is a yet future event that has not happened yet. It's right after the tribulation period, and it's an event that will hearken in the beginning of the millennium. I point that out because there are, are, there are alternate interpretations of the millennial kingdom, and I recognize that. And there are some who look at the millennial kingdom in, in these verses in Revelation 20 as purely metaphorical that they're not referring to anything that is really going to happen. They're just allegory and story. And then some suggest that the millennial kingdom has already happened or is in the process of happening. But what I see in Scripture is that those interpretations actually conflict 
with what Scripture says about Satan and his work here upon the earth. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it tells us this. Be sober-minded and be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Now, that word is in the Greek language is a verb that is in what's called the present active tense. What that means is what is being referred to, the devil prowling around, is an ongoing event that is happening right now as you are reading this verse, okay? So it's happening today. In the book of Job, we read how Satan has access to heaven, or at least some type of limited access, as he goes before God and presents himself with the angels to accuse Job. And then, of course, in Revelation 12, if you were with us then, as we were studying the midpoint of the tribulation, which is still a yet future event to happen, we read there that it was at that point that Satan was finally kicked out of heaven. His access to heaven was revoked in full. As we read there in Revelation 12.10, it said, because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been thrown down. And so again, the language there indicates that he had access up until that point, and Job supports that. I've said this before, but if you've never heard this, it might shock some of you, and it might shock some viewers of this video in the future, but Satan today is not in hell. Hell is not his base of operations today. In fact, chronologically, Satan has never yet been to hell as of today. And when he does get sent there, thrown there, as we're going to read later, he's not going to be the king on the throne in charge of the place. He's not going to be the head of the party. He's not going to be this reigning, ruling leader there in hell. He will be the chief inmate. He will be the number one prisoner, and he will be the lowest and the most tormented of all of them. Now, some of the interpretations of the millennium and these verses in the light of that, people go, well, wasn't Satan defeated at the cross, right? We talk about that. We preach that, that the power of sin and death was defeated by Jesus at the cross. And they go, well, wasn't Satan defeated there? And it's kind of like a yes-no answer because in a sense, yes, he was defeated there. But what we mean by that is his unhindered influence over man's heart was defeated at the cross, that's what we mean when we say the power of sin, our slavery to sin, as the Bible talks about. We were enslaved to sin prior to Christ. All of that was dealt with and broken at the cross. And it was at the cross that we were fully and finally forgiven of sin, not just having our sin covered by sacrifices, but washed away. So the power of sin to condemn us, washed away. The power of death to, to damn us to internal damnation, washed away. So we were forgiven, absolved of the penalty, and freed from the guilt. The Bible also tells us that at the cross we were given a new heart by faith. That new heart is the heart that allows us to say no to sin. You see, prior to the cross, we couldn't really say no to sin. Now, God provided the sacrificial system to, to make atonement for that sin, but it was a temporary covering. But we were s sinners, right? The Bible is very clear that the sacrifices in the Old Testament did nothing to change our heart. They just covered the sin. But when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us we were given a new heart by faith, and so we don't have to sin anymore. It doesn't mean we always choose that, but we don't have to. We have the power granted by this new heart, the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to say, no, I'm going to obey God. I want to do what God wants me to do. But thus then began the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. So, but the Holy Spirit within us, through our faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, is what allows us to say no to Satan's agenda and to walk in the Spirit. But from the cross, all the way up to the millennial kingdom, Satan is and has been still present upon the earth, as it says, to roam, to roar, to tempt, to deceive, the Bible tells us, that he is still active, but what we're seeing here in Revelation 20, after the tribulation takes place, right before the millennial kingdom is ushered in, Satan is then seized, taken into custody. He's arrested and thrown into jail. 
It tells us there that he was bound by a great chain. Those words in the Greek refer to having your freedom restricted by shackles. So it's the picture that comes to mind when you think of somebody being shackled up in jail. That he's confined by restraints. The word through, tossed into the abyss, is an interesting word because it means to be tossed through the air. It's that idea of a bouncer throwing you out of the club, right? Like you've acted up enough, whoo, yeeted right through the air onto the streets. You're tossed out. That's the idea here. And then it says he was sealed in the abyss. And we know the abyss from previous studies is that jail. It's that place of incarceration that the really bad demons were locked up in until the tribulation period. It's not hell itself. It's a temporary prison and abode, but Satan is locked and sealed in there. And it tells us that at this point, he is locked in there so that he could no longer deceive the nations. And that word deceive means to mislead or to cause to go astray. And so, but he isn't bound today. He's not locked up today. His freedom to deceive the nations isn't restricted today. And we don't have to look far to see that, right? Right? We see what's happening around the world. We see what, what some governments and leadership does. We see what people are being led to do as they are deceived by Satan. He is active today. Now, there are many other scriptures that support and indicate this as well, this as well as in addition to 1 Peter 5, 8 and Job. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, we read about Ananias and Sapphira, right? They went and sold their property and they came to give the money. And we read there that Peter... Um, was in, uh, told by the Holy Spirit, they're lying to you. They're, they're not giving everything. They're holding back some of it. And so Peter says to them, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? If Satan's bound, how is he able to fill their heart? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a section there where Paul is dealing with a discipline, how the church is to discipline some immoral members of the church there. And, and he says to, to the church there, he goes, this person who is committing this immorality, he goes, hand that one over to Satan. If Satan is bound, how can you hand anybody over to him? 1 Corinthians 7 is a, is a great instruction to, to married people and single people, but it says in the, the section here about how married couples um, aren't to deny one another the, the physical joys of marriage, right? There's, there's the joy of intimacy in Paul's teaching. Don't deny that to each other, right? Don't use intimacy as a, as a punishment tool. Like, I'm mad at you. He goes, don't do that. Why? He says, so that Satan doesn't tempt you. Again, how can Satan tempt you if he's bound? Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that Satan, who's the prince of the power of the air, is now working in the disobedient. Again, not bound. And then 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Paul says, We wanted to come to you time and time again, but Satan hindered us. It's pretty clear that Satan is not bound today. He wasn't bound then, and he's not going to be bound until he's thrown in jail. Right? So today, we as Christians, the church, we're to be sober-minded, the Bible tells us. Alert. Why? For our adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone whom he could devour. And if Satan is not bound, that means he's not in the abyss. And if Satan is not in the abyss, that means we're not in the millennial yet, millennial kingdom yet. But it will come. It's yet future. And after Satan is removed and bound and chained up for a thousand years, we get to the second major focus of the millennium we see in Revelation 20, verse 4. He goes, Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God, because of the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. And we're going to deal with that in our next message of Revelation. But he says this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And so the second major emphasis of the millennial kingdom in Revelation 20 is the reign of the saints, 
right? We saw Satan bound, Satan jailed. And then we get to this reign of the saints here. Now, he starts out by saying, I saw thrones. I saw thrones, and there's people on these thrones, and they were given authority to judge. That word judge there means, means having administrative and judicial authority. So they're reigning with Christ for this thousand years. Now, granted here in Revelation 20, we're not told specifically, expressly, who these people on these thrones are. So like good Bible students, we have to look to Scripture to interpret Scripture, right? So the question is, what group or what groups of people did God ever make a promise to that they would rule and reign with him? Well, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 18, it says this, but the holy ones, and that word also means saints of the Most High, will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Later on in Daniel 7 and verse 22, it says, the Ancient of Days arrived, and a judgment was given in favor of the holy ones of the Most High, for the time had come, and the holy ones took possession of the kingdom. And then we have Daniel 7, 27, same chapter. He says, the kingdom, dominion, and greatness of the kingdom under all of heaven will be given to the people, the holy ones of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will serve and obey him. So that prophecy that we read about in Daniel chapter 7, speaking of this coming kingdom upon the earth, is referring to these holy ones, or what we call Old Testament saints, right? Old Testament saints were promised rulership in the kingdom. So they will be on these thrones. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, is a verse specifically speaking of the 12 apostles. And at this time in Matthew chapter 19, the apostles were asking Jesus a question that I'm going to paraphrase this way. What do we get out of following you? Right? Like we've never asked that question of God, right? What, what, what are we going to get out of this, right? What, what do we have to look forward to? And then Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, the millennial kingdom, you who have followed me, speaking to the 12 apostles, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So we have the Old Testament saints, and now we have the 12 apostles over the 12 tri tribes of Israel. But wait, there's more. In 1 Corinthians 6.2, we have a teaching regarding the New Testament saints. Because in 1 Corinthians 6.2, Paul is writing to the Christian church. He's writing to the Christian believers of the New Testament church. And the context of the section is how to resolve internal disputes. But he says this. Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge trivial cases? And he's speaking of resolving disputes amongst yourselves. But he kind of offhandedly refers to the saints judging the world, almost as if it was common knowledge. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, it says, if we, the church, endure, we will also reign with him. 1 Peter 2, it says, we, the church, are a royal priesthood. And then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, which was written to the church, right, it says, to the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And then Revelation 5.10, and again, chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation, I believe is a picture of the church already in heaven prior to tribulation. The church sings, those elders on those 24 thrones, they sing, you have made us a kingdom. Or another way to translate that is, you have made us kings and priests to our God. So I think if you just read the New Testament and pay attention to what it's saying, you can't miss the fact that, that, that the New Testament saints, the church, are going to be ruling and reigning as well. So the people on the thrones that, that John sees here in Revelation 20 is the Old Testament saints. It's the 12 apostles over the 12 tribes of Israel, Israel and it's the New Testament saints, the church, right? But there's another group reigning with Christ as well, because in verse 4b, the second half of the verse, John said, I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus. That phrase, I also saw, means I see a different group of people, the people on the thrones, and then I also saw a different group of people. They are not the church. They are not the Old Testament saints. They are not the apostles. 
but he describes them pretty graphically, right? We don't have to really dig deep to understand who he's talking about here. These are the ones that died during the tribulation time for their faith in Jesus Christ. And so collectively, who's ruling and reigning with Jesus during the millennial kingdom? The Old Testament saints, the 12 apostles, the New Testament saints, and the tribulation saints. That's who, what we refer to as those people who died during the tribulation, who put their faith in Jesus during that seven-year period we have been studying throughout Revelation. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about all of those who are, who are a part of this are going to return with Christ to the earth in glorified bodies. So this group, these Old Testament saints, 12 apostles, New Testament saints, tribulation saints, we're all going to return with Christ in glorified bodies to rule and reign with him during the millennium. And I just think that's beautiful. I think it's, it's pretty fun and ironic that we're going to return and rule and reign over the very place that Satan is expelled from and jailed from for a thousand years. Now that leads to another question. If we were ruling and reigning, who are we ruling and reigning over during the millennial kingdom, right? Well, don't forget that there are people Humans on earth who survive, live through the tribulation period, right? The, the tribulation period is a devastation upon the earth, and millions die, but, but not everybody dies. Not everybody upon the earth dies during the tribulation time. Specifically, you remember the 144,000 Jewish evangelists? It told us earlier in Revelation that God protects them through tribulation, that the Antichrist and, and his minions, he, he goes after them. He tries to kill them, but, but they're protected by God. So at the end of the tribulation period, they're still alive. Now, it doesn't make sense to me that God is going to be like, all right, you guys are still alive. Boom, killed. Boom, brought back in glorified bodies. That doesn't make any sense. So the idea is that they proceed into the millennial kingdom still in their earthly bodies. We read throughout tribulation that that two-thirds of the Jewish, specifically Jewish population, is killed during the tribulation time. But there is a third, a remnant, that remains. Remains at the end of tribulation in their earthly bodies, still living on earth into the millennial kingdom. And then, of course, there's no indication that every single non-Jew is killed upon the earth. So there are Gentile believers that enter into the millennial kingdom. And so the idea is that every person who begins life in the millennial kingdom, whether they're in an earthly body or a heavenly body, they're all God's people. So at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, the earth is populated 100% with people who believe that Jesus Christ is God, Lord, and Savior. That's going to be a cool time. Now, in Matthew chapter 25, we see an indication of this, um, just to give you some scriptural support. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31 Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and this is referring to the second coming of Christ at the end of tribulation, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, speaking of the kingdom that he's going to be ruling, the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. Verse 32, it says, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, speaking of the sheep. This is a picture of believers, those who survived tribulation but believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He says, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then later on in Matthew 25 and verse 41, it says, then he will also say to those on the left, the goats, which is a picture of non-believers who survived tribulation, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So chronologically, tribulation is done. There are people still alive on earth. Some believe, some don't. There is this judgment, the separation of the sheep and goats before the millennial kingdom embarks or, or is, is um, embarked upon. And the wicked are cast into hell. And then when the actual thousand-year reign of Christ um, begins, it's all believers. And so what a beautiful picture of a, of a kingdom of God full of people who believe that he is God, that he is the Savior, some in glorified bodies, 
that are ruling and reigning in all the positions of administration and leadership and, and, and political power, I guess, if you want to say that, but some still in earthly bodies. And over the course of the thousand years, we looked at last time that the curse of, of death and decay is going to be lifted, and so there's going to be a longevity restored to humanity. And so there's going to be some people who get to the millennial reign of Christ, and they've lived 50, 40, 60, 30, 80 years here on earth, and then there's going to be a longevity that is restored to them as they continue to live on through the millennial reign of Christ. But humans on earth during this thousand years, they're going to repopulate. There's pictures of that in Scripture that, that it's not going to just be everybody sterile and we're just like, oh, worshiping God and doing nothing else. That, that life on earth is going to continue under the rulership of Jesus Christ and people are going to populate. Now, when humans have babies, what kind of babies are they? Human. Trick question. <laughs> humans have human babies, right? We know that. That's basic biology. Like, biology isn't fully dismantled yet by our educational system. We still understand that, right? Humans have human babies. Well, those human babies are going to be born in earthly bodies. And those earthly bodies are still going to inherit, inherit the sin nature that is the nature of human flesh. Now, although the effect of the curse on physical bodies is lifted, right, sickness is, is no longer here, short lifespans are gone, the spiritual nature of mankind, the, the spiritual nature that man has inherited since the fall, since Adam and Eve, it's going to remain within the flesh. Now, these offspring that people are going to have are going to receive the same free will gift that God gives to all of us now to say yes or no to Jesus Christ. They're going to have that same opportunity. Now, although outward righteousness is going to be enforced with an iron rod. It told us that, that Jesus is going to rule with an iron rod during this kingdom, uh, meaning that that peace is going to prevail. Many interpret this to mean that, that, that the result, the fruit of sin, the fruit of wickedness and evil, it's not even going to be allowed to, to grow, to flourish, to fester. Some go so far as to say that when the evil thought even enters the mind, it is dealt with immediately because Jesus Christ is here on earth ruling and reigning with his people throughout the entire planet. But the idea is this, is that outward righteousness is going to be enforced. That goodness and righteousness and, and, and you know, the, all of those things that we consider a part of our faith and our Christianity that Jesus would want upon the earth, it's going to be enforced upon the entire planet. And then through that, it, we, we read last time that all the weapons of the planet are going to be smashed into plowshares that all military training will cease, right? There's going to be no more fighting between nations and whatnot. Although all of that is, is in place, the inward depravity of the human heart, the human nature will still be present. That human nature and that free will that has the ability to choose, and as we are about to see, some will still choose rebellion against God despite the fact that he is bodily here ruling and reigning for a thousand years, despite the fact that all government is perfect, despite the fact that there's no more crime and no more wickedness and no more evil, despite the fact that, that trafficking is eradicated, despite the fact all it's, it's a perfect utopia. But the human heart is still the same. And this brings us to the third major focus of the millennium in Revelation 20, which is the final rebellion and the release of Satan. Read with me in verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Now, this is one of the great mysteries of Scripture to me. Right? Why, after having incarcerated the devil, put him in jail, removed his influence over the human heart, removed his influence over the earth, why on earth would God ever let him out again? Why would he unbound Satan? Right? To me, in my limited human intellect, I'm going, that, what's up with that, God? Like, he's the bad guy. You dealt with him. Well, I don't have a really great answer for this, okay? I, I labored, and I studied, and I thought about it, and, and I was seeking, you know, well, what are other pastors and, and theologians saying about this? And, and there are a lot of ideas 
about exactly why, but, but it doesn't tell us here, right? It doesn't say, and he let him out, and this is why. It just says that he did, right? Um, but I found a quote from the founder of the Dallas Seminary, and he said this, because someone asked him the same question. Why does God let Satan out at the end of the millennium? And he said, well, you tell me why God loosed him the first time, and I'll tell you why God loses him the second time. You know, when Satan fell, why didn't God just eradicate him right there, right? That's a question we have. That's the question that skeptics have. Why is there evil? Why doesn't God do something about it, right? Um, A lot of people call them imponderable questions, right? Like we could think about it, but but it's, it's really beyond our understanding here and now. But I do think that the two things are related and possibly give us a glimpse into our understanding, at least part of why God does this. You see, the first time Satan fell, being a beautiful angel, angel and servant of God, and he fell and pride entered his heart, and he said, I will be like the most high. And he took a third of the angels with him and, and, and all of this. The, God didn't destroy him there because God had given mankind the gift of free will. He gave us free will, right? He gave us the ability to choose. God said, I love you. I want you to love me back, but I'm not going to force you to love me back because that's not love. All right? He's not going to make us robots that we love God because there's no other choice. No, there's choice. And how do you really have choice without two opposite things to choose from? And so the first time Satan fell, God allowed Satan to continue so that he could honor the free will that he gifted to us as his creation. The free will to choose to obey him or to choose to not obey him. And I think Letting Satan out the second time at the end of the millennial highlight, millennial kingdom is highlighting the same issue. You see, this further emphasizes the point and the purpose of the millennial kingdom because that's another question. After tribulation, he locks up Satan. Why, why another thousand years? <laughs> Come on. Let's just get to eternity. Let's get to paradise. But part of the point of the millennium um, serves to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that humans, we have nothing to blame our sin on. We have nothing to blame our sin on. When it comes to sin, we are ultimately responsible. It's our choice. We're the ones who exercise the free will God gave us to disobey. We're the ones who make the choice to do what God says no to. We're the ones that, that make that choice. It's not our environment. Because the millennial kingdom will be a perfect environment. It's not our government. Because during the millennial kingdom, we'll have a perfect government. It's not whether or not Jesus is physically here, because he'll be physically here for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom. It's not the devil's fault, because he's locked up in jail and he can't even tempt you. Not our upbringing. While sin and unrighteousness will not even be allowed to fester and to grow and to poison society during the millennial kingdom because, again, Jesus is ruling with an iron rod. It will still be present in the nature and the heart of man. And letting Satan out one more time proves that because the very first chance mankind gets to disobey God and fight against him, they take it. They take it. Many will believe in Jesus during the millennial kingdom that are being born, but many will still not. And so, and that'll bring it all to final judgment. So God lets Satan out, and he deceives the nations again. And how does he deceive the nation? Well, it's the same way he's always been doing it. Go back to the very beginning, right? Did God really say, as he mentioned to Eve in the garden, did God really mean that? Does God, right? He questions God. And because there's people born in the millennium with this sin nature who maybe have been harboring it inside, living under enforced righteousness, but, but finally there's an opportunity to act out outwardly what is inward here. It says in verse 8, he goes out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. So again, that word deceive there, right? It means to lead astray. 
Another way to word that is to cause one to outwardly express disobedience. Because remember, again, nobody's able to outwardly express disobedience to God during the millennial kingdom. And it says that these people are like the, they number the sand of the sea. All right? That, that, just, that just means a lot of people. Right? You ever gone to the beach try and count the sand? It's, it's a lot. Right? You can't count it. Um, Jeremiah was absolutely right when he said that the human heart is most deceitful and desperately wicked. He was spot on. And so, this rebellion here, this answers the question. Well, if Satan was gone, would man still sin? Would man still want to sin? And as we've seen, the, the human nature is still there in those born of the flesh. And so, absolutely, because we know sin comes from inside us. That is something the Bible teaches. Sin comes from inside us. It comes from our fallen nature. It comes from the flesh. Satan simply creates an environment to, to, to tempt that. He simply creates an environment to stimulate the flesh and then lays a temptation before us, but we are still the ones who choose to sin. We're the ones that say, yes, I will disobey God. Now, you could remove the devil, you could remove the enticement, but the point, the human heart is still deceitful and desperately wicked. We're sinners by nature. That's been the message the whole time, guys, <laughs> right? The Bible, Genesis to Revelation, we're sinners by nature. It, 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 it's a truth. You see, the, the millennial kingdom will put to rest the, the, the nurture versus nature debate for all time, right? Because modern secular psychology, well, you know, nurture, nature, right? Is it upbringing? The millennial kingdom is going to be like, it's nature, period, end of story, through and through. And then, you know, it's so all those questions, like why is there crime? Why do people kill each other? Why is there murder? Why is there alcoholism? Why is there drug abuse? Why is there trafficking? Why, is, uh, why, are, why do all these evils exist in the world because of the heart of man. That's the point. A perfect everything outside of us won't change a thing about the nature of the flesh. A thousand years of Christ ruling won't change it. A thousand years of Christ here walking among mankind won't change it. A thousand years of people observing these, these other people in glorified heavenly bodies <laughs> won't change it. None of it will change the fallen nature of a person unless the fallen person says, I want my sins forgiven. I'm sorry I've broken your law, God. I believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, and I exercise my own free will to submit my life to him and his lordship. Jesus, I'm yours. Come into my life. And it's going to be the same during the millennial kingdom. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, right? Unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. It's why God stepped out of eternity 2,000 years ago, and we're going to celebrate it next week, came to this earth, born of the flesh, to live a perfect life, ultimately to die for you and for me. He did it 2,000 years ago. It still applies to us today. It's why all that took place. Jesus Christ addressed the problem, the sickness that plagued humanity, a nature, a nature that we could do nothing about. No matter how hard we try, we can't change our nature. We're ultimately sinful. And Jesus not only addressed the problem, but provided the remedy. A new nature. A new heart, the Bible says, granted freely by salvation, freely given by God. But it's a gift that has to be received with the free will of the receiver. So, Satan is released. The first thing he does when he's released, God, I'm really sorry, bro. I know I did a lot of bad things. No. First thing he does, organize a war against God. Why? Because he'll never change. Thousand years in jail didn't rehabilitate him. His nature, his character does not change. He is and remains the devil, the deceiver, the dragon, 
That is who he is. And so it's the same tricks, the lies, the deception, the false religion, the false ideas about God, and all of this stuff. So it gives us this weird detail here, and I want to address this real quick for those of you that are, that are interested in these types of things. It brings up this phrase, Gog and Magog, right? I go, what is that, right? What, what, what does that even mean? Like, it almost sounds like somebody <coughs> coughing as they're trying to write it down, right? <coughs> but it's actually a thing in the Bible, right? Historically, Magog was a grandson of Noah. So when Noah was in the ark, and then the waters receded, and the ark landed, and he had his family there, and then they went out, and, and through that, they ended up repopulating the earth. Magog was a grandson of Noah, and his offspring, his people, f- settled far north of Israel, north of the Black Sea, in the area we know today as Russia, okay? So Russians are, are far descendants from Magog in, in, in that understanding, now, Gog and Magog, these words, they first appear for us in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, and then they appear again here in Revelation 20. Now, we don't have time to exhaustively go through the details here, so I'm going to try and give you a quick synopsis. Um, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there is a prophecy written about a future attack against Israel led by a, na- a man named Gog. And it says this man, Gog, is from Magog or is of the land of Magog. So he's, he's from this, this descendants of Magog, okay? Now, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's all kinds of details about this attack, and, and it tells us a whole bunch of details, but, but from a prophetical standpoint, we understand that this attack that is prophesied in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is understood to take place either before the tribulation possibly before the rapture of the church, some, some seem to see there, um, or it happens during the first three and a half years of tribulation. And so some people say it's before the tribulation because in Ezekiel 39 it says, after God rescues Israel from this attack, that Israel will be burning the weapons of the enemies for seven years. So it, it, you know, the tribulation is seven years long, so it has to happen right before that for that to happen. And then it says they spend seven months um, burying the dead from this battle. So that's people that go, it's definitely before. Others go, no, 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 it's, it's in the very beginning of uh, the tribulation period because Ezekiel 38 says that this attack by Gog from Magog comes during a time of peace with Israel, that there's peace in the land. And we know that the beginning of the tribulation starts with the Antichrist making a peace treaty with Israel, right? And they get to rebuild their temple. And so, you know, there's finally peace in the land of Israel that the world is like, okay, we're good. We're, 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 nobody's attacking you anymore. And, but, you know, this attack from Gog could be what precipitates the peace treaty, right? Like this is the final attack on Israel, and, and the Antichrist is the one who rises up and goes, okay, we're enough, we're done with all of this, and then the peace treaty comes in and all that. So that's, that's interpretive, but Ezekiel 38, 19 tells us that Gog and his armies, they don't win. They don't win. They attack Israel, and God intervenes and saves Israel, and Gog and his armies are wiped out. So Gog and Magog is now brought up again here in Revelation chapter 20, but it's not the same event. It's not the same people um, for, again, a number of reasons we don't have time to get into, but John is using Gog and Magog symbolically here to show that, that the people that are rebelling at the end of the millennial kingdom are doing it with the same attitude, the same antagonism, the same hatred for God and his people that the battle of Gog and Magog or the, the attack from them was seen in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So that's all we have time to go into that for. So. Uh, but go read it. Uh, there, you'll, you'll see a lot of parallels, um, and then you'll see a lot of differences between the two. And so, and maybe one day we'll dig through that in detail. But for the sake of Revelation 20, we see here that it says people from across the entire planet, it says the breath of the earth, it says, are gathered from the four corners of the earth, and they come again against God's city. We know it's God's city because Jerusalem is often referred to as the beloved city. So we know that that's God's, uh, uh, Jerusalem, God's city. We also know that during the millennial kingdom, that's where God, Jesus Christ himself here on earth is ruling and reigning from, um, that city there. And so, but the important detail there is it's not much of a battle. It says they gather from the breath of the earth. They gather from the four corners, right? Armies everywhere, and they march on Jerusalem, and we're gonna get you, God. You've been ruling over us for a thousand years, and we're tired of it. And what does it say? Eh, fire from heaven, pff, they're all burned up. 
just burned up, <laughs> consumed with the fire. That word consumed there means utterly destroyed. So verse 10, the devil then who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is where the devil finally gets his due, his final judgment. And we learn a number of things just from this one verse. What it tells us here is we see that Satan has limited power, limited ability. He's no match for God. He never was. He never will be. God and Satan are not two equal forces on the side of good and evil. Satan is a fallen angel, a creation of God, no match. All that Satan has ever been able to do has been allowed by God, and, and that's a whole other Bible study about why does God allow things. But, but everything that Satan has ever done is under the purview of the Lord, is under his sovereignty. He has limited power. God put him in prison. God released him from prison. And then God finally ends his career by throwing him into the lake of fire. And it's that same word again, right? Yeet, there he goes, right? He's gone, tossed through the air. All of it, however, is under the sovereign control of God. We learn then that Satan only operates by God's permission. We saw that in Job, right? He had to get God's permission to go mess with Job. And God gave him limited permission. First it was like, okay, so take all his stuff, but don't harm him. And then it was, okay, you can mess with his health, health, but you can't kill him. And Satan was only able to do what God allowed him to do. When we saw the, uh, the demons that, that fled into the herd of pigs in Galilee, right? You remember they asked Jesus for permission, <laughs> you know? Please don't send us to the abyss. Let us go into the pigs. Asking permission from the sovereign God. And then Jesus once said to Peter, hey, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat asked. But Jesus said, ah, but I've been praying for you. So God has been and will always be in sovereign control. We also learn here that Satan's judgment, although it was assured at the cross, isn't fully fulfilled until this point. That from the cross until this point, Satan is and has been allowed to roam and to, to, to roar and to tempt. He's doing that today. It's not until Revelation 12 that we read he's finally kicked out of heaven for good, that he doesn't even, he, he still has access today to go into the throne room of heaven and say, I want to I accuse Nathan. I want to accuse, put in your name in that thing. God's like, oh, really? And some of us are like, please, no. <laughs> Don't. I've read Job, right? But it's at Revelation 12 where his access to heaven is, is fully revoked. And then it's at the end of tribulation where he's incarcerated into the abyss, no access to heaven at all, no access to earth at all, no access to the people on earth at all. But then he's finally let out one last time, have one last temper tantrum, then he's thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur forever. And you notice it tells us that the beast and the prophet are already there. Why? Because they were tossed in a thousand, year pre thousand years previous at the very beginning of the millennium after the tribulation time. Now, this brings us to another question. How long is hell? Well, how long will the devil be there with the beast and the false prophet? It says day and night forever and ever. That phrase day and night is a figurative speech in the Greek that means without intermission. <clears throat> so they're going to be in the lake of fire without intermission forever and ever. No breaks. No clocking in and clocking out. Again, Satan is not ruling down there. And then that phrase, forever and ever, literally means to the ages of the ages. And I was like, okay, what, what does that mean, right? Well, I found one Greek scholar put it this way. There is no way possible in the Greek language to state more emphatically the notion of endlessness. That's what day and night forever and ever means. What it means is day and night forever and ever. Without end. Without intermission. Hell is forever. It's going to be forever for the beast. It's going to be forever for the false prophet. It's going to be forever for the devil. And it's going to be forever for all who exercise their free will and choose to go there. It's not an eternal party. It tells us there that what happens there forever, day and night, is that they are tormented. This is the experience of those who go to hell. They are tormented. That word means to be punished by physical torture. To suffer extreme physical harassment, never-ending, without intermission. And, 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 and again, 
skeptics go, why would God send anybody there? If he is a God of love, why would he send people to hell? Well, he doesn't want to send anybody there. Jesus told us that hell was created for the devil and his demons, but the decision is ours, as we have been talking about. The decision is mankind. God gave us free will. We get to choose. We get to choose. We get to exercise the free will that God gave us to choose heaven or hell. And the Bible goes to great lengths to teach about both, to warn about the consequences of denying God, the creator, the one who is worthy of all praise and all obedience and all everything. So it's not like we don't know. It's not like, oops, hey, nobody told me. We have the word of God that very clearly says, look, those who deny God are choosing hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. Humans send themselves there by choice. That's the reality. The Bible tells us that God loves us with an everlasting love, and it is true. He loves us, and it would violate him and his character of love to to force us to love him back. God will never force anybody to love him. You know what that also means? He will not force you to spend forever in eternity with him. You spend your entire life saying, I don't want anything to do with God. I hate him. The idea of him is is disgusting. It's foul. I want nothing. I don't want to live by his rules. I don't want to live by, I don't want to be under his roof. And you think God is going to force you to do that forever? He loves you too much to do that. And although it breaks his heart, he will let you choose hell. Well, this is the end of the devil. This is his last stand, his final hurrah, his destiny. To spend day and night forever and ever burning in the lake of fire and sulfur. Tormented. That is the price for disobedience to God. That is the price for sin. That is the price. We were born with a nature that says, I want to deny God, I hate him, I'll do my own thing, and I don't care what he says. And I think if any of us really, really, truly believed that, that hell was real, <laughs> really understood what it meant, I don't think many would be like, yeah, i choose that. Because the devil deceives. Hell's not real. Hell's not torment. The devil's not real. God doesn't really mean it when he says, God is a God of love. He's going to let everybody in. And he lies and he lies and he lies. But the destiny of that liar and that deceiver is torment forever. Now, whether you do it consciously and intentionally or whether you do it as a puppet thinking, I'm the master of my own destiny and I just defy the idea of God, either way, Denying God is following Satan, and the outcome is the same. It's going to be hell forever. But it doesn't have to be. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can choose him today. It's simply a process of acknowledging you broke his law. You deserve the penalty. The penalty is death. A physical death, yes, and an eternal suffering. Like, it's not annihilation. It's not wink out of existence. The Bible's very clear about that. But Jesus Christ, God himself came, clothed himself in the flesh, lived a perfect life a couple thousand years ago, born as a baby, grew as a man, lived a life and then died on the cross to pay the penalty for everybody's sin. And he was the only one that could do that because he was God. He was the only one that was perfect, the only one without blemish. And so he suffered the full wrath of God on the cross, taking the punishment for our sin. And then he says, just believe in me. Just believe in who I am. Trust in what I did for you. And in that, let me give you a new heart. Let me give you a new nature. Let me me come and dwell within you, that God, the Holy Spirit, will dwell within you. Just let me do that. That's how much I love you. But in the same breath, he'll say, I love you enough to let you exercise your own free will. 
but I can't urge you enough. Choose Jesus. Far better. Far better than the, the torment that awaits those who deny him. And if you choose Jesus today, you'll find that your creator is standing there with open arms ready to receive you. Next time, we're going to talk about the two resurrections. The first one, as we read about, and the second one, and the two deaths that are spoken of in this chapter in greater detail. Um, but I pray that, that as we close out this year and spend the next couple of weeks focusing on the birth of Christ and who he is and what he's done and then move into the new year looking at just reminding ourselves what he's done this year in our church and looking forward to the next year that we don't lose sight of the goal. The goal is not church. The goal is not ministry. The goal is not all those things. The goal is Jesus Christ. To know him, to live for him, and to share him with everybody we can, that they would have the promise and the hope of heaven as well. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we trust you, God, in your, in your word. We believe in you and your word. God, we see in your word, God, the, the judgment that's going to fall upon the devil and his demons. We're saddened, Lord, and I know we're not saddened as much as you are to know that there are those who choose to go there who reject the free gift of salvation, and Lord, I know that breaks your heart. Your word says that you died for the whole world, that all who would call upon the name of Jesus Christ would be saved, that they would not perish but have everlasting life. While we're praying, I just want to give a quick opportunity. If you're in this room and God has been speaking to you today about your need for salvation, I want to pray with you. If you're online and you're watching right now and God has been speaking to you about your need for salvation, that you have never yielded your life to him, you have never exercised the free will that God gave you to say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're God. I know I have sinned and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Come into my life. Be my Lord and master. Be my savior. Give me a new heart, a new nature to obey you. If you've never prayed that prayer, I'm going to pray right now, and I just want you to pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I stand before you, and I believe in you. I believe that you are God. I believe you died for my sin, and I know I've sinned. I know I've broken your law. I know I've been disobedient to you. Forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for my sin. I believe your word that says I am forgiven because of my faith in you. I believe your word that says you're giving me a new heart and a new nature that is able to say yes to you, to obey you. Help me to live for you Help me to grow and mature in my faith. Help me to be a shining light of the gospel in this very dark world. I love you so much. Thank you for loving me so much. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer this morning, and you just... You believe that. You meant that in your heart. The Bible says you're saved. You're forgiven. Hallelujah. Right? Your life has changed forever. I remember my life being changed by Jesus. Right? I stopped sneaking in under the Christmas tree. No, man. I was saved as an adult. So I didn't, yeah, I didn't do that at that time. So <laughs> God loves you so much. That's what Christmas is all about. God loves you. Gave you a gift that you can never earn. That's what we're celebrating over the next couple weeks, and we've been celebrating all month. But if you gave your life to the Lord today, we want to help you. We have uh, these things we call new believers packets up front. Please come forward and grab one. They're in these white envelopes. If you leave out the back, ask one of the elders out there, I need a new believers packet. We'll give you one. It's free. If you're online and you're not local to us, let us know in chat. We'll mail it to you. Because we want to help you on this walk, this relationship you now have with your creator. 
to grow and learn of him, that you would live the way he wants you to do, that you would tell people about what God has done in your life because it is glorious. And the future that you know how you now have to look forward to in Jesus Christ, ah, oh, it's glorious. One day the devil will be defeated and cast aside and done and judged and gone forever. I can't wait for that. I look forward to that. But right now, he is still active. He's still prowling. Don't forget that. But never forget that he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Amen? God bless you guys. Let's worship.